Hello everyone, today we talk about the Earldom of Orkney and the Kingdom of the Isle uh, Army organization. It's a, you know, fascinating topic considering the times and spaces. Uh, as we'll see, these were lands with not much of a great military potential in absolute terms. But definitely, given in fact the context, uh, it's still remarkable um, the resilience, first of all, of these systems, but also the forces that were able uh, they, they were able to deploy. So, you know what we're talking about here. Um, these um, polities originated as uh, semi-independent Norwegian possessions in the north and west Scotland, dating back to va Viking times, as the Scandinavians uh, had began to settle there since the late 8th century, All right, as a base for their further raids, but properly with a, with a settlement uh, in intention and the earldom of Orkney, uh, including the Shetlands as well, was established uh, in particular by King Harald Finehair of Norway, uh, following their subjugation. There was a resistance, of course, and along with the Hebrides and the Isle of Man, in the late ninth century. Uh, thereafter, the earldom of Orkney nominally included. Thus, all the Scottish Isles, plus an amount actually of northern Scotland itself, right, a good northern part, and um, the Earl Thorfinn the Mighty, uh, 1014 1064, is a meaningful year if you look at the surrounding history, and um, at one point was was said to have held as nine Scottish earldoms, reaching as far as Moray plus the Hebrides and part of Ireland too. Um, note that the, the main uh, picture here, main goal, was to, to create a, a maritime connection, right? So the idea that of course the interland was more difficult to, to acquire, but that still these important fortified areas of the coasts could f form a sort of connective fabric to uh, support uh, logistically, all these, these further expansions actually is 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 the key here. Um, however, given this ideal picture of unity, which probably never existed as such, uh, the extent of, in fact, each um, later earl's domain uh, depended mostly on his ability to impose right um, his will on the subjected areas. That was complicated by the other difficult task actually to mm, the, the for to the earl's offspring to succeed simultaneously to, to, to the, his title so that um, at any generation that normally there were at least mm, there were two earls right normally and sometimes even more contending uh, power and as a consequence in, internal strife was somewhat endemic this uh, the key here is also realizing that, that there was no real local capacity of centralization, right? That the invasions could bring these lands under some control, but naturally leaving them a ruled, uh, administered by, by someone was something completely different. And in fact, it's not that even Norway actually had a firm uh, hold of these lands, but the, the, the same were ruled by, you know, very, you know, in a by figures that would change over time quite 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 fluidly, you know, in this kind of unstable situation. And therefore, uh, this uh, ideal unity of the picture is was also broken on a kind of, a ge you know, even a geographical base, um, considering the Hebrides and the Isle of Man being independent from the, the Orkneys that were technically the... Uh, I don't know, say, not necessarily the core land, because as a matter of fact, the Kingdom of the Isle, or of Sudreyar, as we will see here, the, the land, the Southern Isles, as they were called, were uh, larger, right? So the, you have the, the Orkneys, they were the Northern Isles, and then the uh, the ones in west of Scotland, uh, as um, the, known as the Southern ones, uh, Sudreyar, as we're in fact saying. Um, t um, so... These constituted, a, the latter constituted a kingdom proper, which included lands such as Kintyre, um, so other parts of uh, western, the western Scottish coasts, um, and 
as a matter of fact, it, th there is a bit of confusion in the terms because, uh, as I was doing shortly uh, ago, in calling them also Western Isles, not not Southern Isles. But this, however, at least if you look at it on the map, it's kind of easy to to get. So after 1156, there was even a further split between the at this point literally independent kings in Man and the Hebrides, right? Who like their uh, Orkney, uh, their Orcadian counterpart, basically spent much of, most of their time fighting one another, right? And as you understand, this is no recipe for you know particular political stability over time, and this is what is usually imputed to the the decline of these polities, but it, it's not that simple either. So. Uh, it's worth noticing here that I throughout this period, so these lands were actually well off in a sense, because as we will see now better, local resources weren't much, as you can imagine. But surely, um, from a from a in terms of trade posts and tr volume of traffic, this thing was impo was imposing, right? especially the connection of the trade revolving around the Irish Sea uh, up to up to Nor Scandinavia, up to Norway. Um, these lands work uh, as a bridge and they they grew in importance and also the the participation that you know like as kind of uh, bases from which to launch raids even as you know deep into Scotland's and other lands brought al also other people to join to invest in them so that um, also this for the sake of army composition that we'll see now speaks for sometimes also large contingents that were not uh, as we will see the, the, the local potential was minimal but there were also a lot of people joining from elsewhere. Um, and that wealth we're speaking of is also what actually kept properly these polities together. Um, the first king of the Southern Isles had been uh, actually a Dublin Viking, Godfred uh, Citrixson, who uh, even fought for Harald Artrada at Samford Bridge in, in, ten, in 1066. So that tells you how strong, naturally, the Norwegian connection in the, you know, the Gallo North, uh, North Society was and how these uh, islands were uh, the, 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 the base of projection uh, towards other, you know, uh, other the, towards the surroundings. Also, the last king of the Sudraya, of the Southern Isles, was Dugald Olofsson, who died in 1268. Um, there are other. Th th these are not particularly documented realities, as you can imagine. That there, there are other figures, such as uh, Ivar, about whom we do not know so much. Then, um, the last king of Man was um, Dagal's brother Magnus Olafsson, twelve fifty four, twelve sixty five, um, and uh, the latter being particularly important because he acknowledged Scottish suzerainty, um, triggering the famous expedition of King Hakon IV of Norway to Scotland, the invasion of Scotland, the region invasion of Scotland in 12, as late as 1263. And as you know, uh, this was a, a, a crucial moment because the, the Norwegians were defeated and, and the Scots managed to extend further uh, their influence in this northern area, nor, northern, northwestern area. We're talking specifically as Scotland, as Alba, uh, as, um, as the lowlands now. And there is all here a, a beautiful picture, maybe we cannot uh, digress on, but it's the idea proper that these uh, northern lands were the, the last true, let's say, Gaelic ones, whereas the lowlands from which Scotland was emerging were the Normanized areas that, um, you know, after the the 1066 invasion of Britain, um, and, uh, I mean, from, from, the, from Normandy, of course, that um, were pushing to, to bring these areas under control. In fact, if we were to describe this world uh, from a military point of view, we actually notice uh, a, an important division. We made a video on the Galloglies, on the Highlanders, um, you know, uh, looking at specifically this kind of properly Scandinavian or at least Scandinavized um, military style that is not even... Pro if we actually look at this period... Um, uh, Kingdom of the Isle armies and um, and uh, and I can we we essentially see that there is still a, sub, a a distinction between them and places like Iceland 
or Norway. These areas are similar to, to Ireland in a way. These are essentially uh, still a Gaelic North society uh, in a sense, and even local warfare would remain uh, quite uh, quite primitive. We can't say it um, compared to to the surroundings, right? And uh, um, even uh, well, of course, more than Britain, right? Um, with Ireland, maybe not so different, but even in there, there were important changes that you know, if you look at the at the highlands in certain areas, were also you know more more developed than them, um, and. Um, we made this, but uh, if you look in the medieval uh, Britain and Ireland playlist, there, there is enough of that. We'll keep talking about it. Uh, but these are contexts even from uh, which, I don't know, Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth of Scotland, I mean, the, the real guy, not, not the, the character that Shakespeare eventually took in, inspiration from. That is, of course, is histori historically, you know, it's contextualized, but he's kind of the, the villain, right, the evil guy, because Shakespeare wanted to kind of um, annoy uh, James the Sixth um, of Scotland, eventually James the First of England uh, at the time. So saying this guy had basically seized the throne um, in the story of Scotland, and Macbeth actually did that. He was actually a Gaelic-speaking le uh, leader. There was no villain, at least, uh, you know, he was no better nor worse than the other leaders around would actually um, um, seized the throne of Alpa from the kind of Anglo-Saxon backed uh, nobility to eventually be overthrown and killed famously. Uh, and in that sense, is you know, in historical terms, aside from the the adaptation, uh, the the modern adaptation, he is uh, it's kind of an heroic figure, romantic figure, of course, in this broader idea of you know the, the Celts of the Celtic fringe still fighting against it, the invaders uh, that eventually would have the upper hand. Um, but we're talking of realities that were very, um, you know, uh, very dynamic, right? And you definitely find that Scandinavian layer placed on it, as we'll see now, mostly reflecting on what Scandinavians have mostly done, and just by for the sake of communication, that point was the thing, that these, uh, these are isles, um, they're maritime potential. Their ships, and we'll talk about in a while, uh, with, with important resemblance with the Scandinavian world, even just for the sake of military organization. That, I mean, it's not that it's dramatically different from place to another in medieval Europe, but still, you know, there are significant um, distances at some point. So, as we were saying before, the earldom of Orkney reached the height of its power in the mid 11th century under Thorfinn the Might. And uh, there is a uh, general consensus about, you know, looking at its decline, to, at least in its beginnings, uh, towards the mid-12th century, the century afterwards. But still there are sources, significantly the, the Orkney saga, that is particularly, uh, you know, it's like the, the principal source on, on these realities, states specifically that the last of the um, Orcadian three uh, greatest earls was Harald Maddaderson, who became earl at the age of five in 1134, and that ruled from 1158 to 1206. So speaking theoretically uh, still of a, of a unitary um, a dimension of, of the uh, of the Orkney uh, political, you know, status. So nevertheless, uh, the earldom's mainland possessions uh, were reduced at this time, objectively, yes, more more than just uh, Caithness uh, in the course of the 12th century. Um, and uh, they also lost um, the co control of the Shetlands that um, was um, actually assumed directly by the Norwegian crown in il uh, 1195. So the Norwegian kings were, mm, were actually eager to and somewhat also obliged, uh, given the prestige and also income they would derive from to, to reassert their, their power on the on the Isles, and by force, as you understand, so they had become fundamentally in, independent. This happened under Magnus Barelegs, ruling between uh, 1093 and 1103, uh, in the, the beginning of the 11th century, and as we've seen, Akon the Fort um, in in the 13th. He ruled between, in fact, 12. 17 and the same 1263. In fact, King Archon died during the campaign, um, 
after having been defeated by by the Scots, and uh, he, mm, you know, appointed his last uh, living son Magnus as a successor, who decided eventually to to surrender, um, let's say, uh, the their Norwegian claims on to the Hebrides and the Isle of Man uh, to to Scotland, right, and therefore. Um, Basically, opening to their uh, to to the Scottish conquest, except actually by the uh, by the Isle of Man that would be conquered by Edward the First of England in 1290. So the Orkney and the Shetlands, however, s uh, still remained Norwegian possessions right up to the 60s of the 15th century. Um, still witnessing, however a degree of Scottish infiltration. In fact, uh, by 1231, um, the uh, the Earls of Orkney were, were Scots, fundamentally, but they still recognized the Norwegian suzerainty. Uh, also, uh, m uh, the, the MacDonalds clan, self-styled um, Lords of the Isles, rulers of Argyll and the Aberdeen on behalf of the Scottish crown at that point. Um, so these were still, however, peripheral areas. The Scots could also in here um, administer uh, uh, in a decentralized way. Um, and uh, the MacDonalds specifically descending from Somerland that had been king of the Hebrides in 1158-64. Uh, and uh, these were areas, as, as we've seen, were deeply influenced also by Ireland. Um, they, these were... Basically, also the majority of these regions were Gallo-like, so that, if I'm not wrong, etymologically means like the um, uh, the foreign young uh, mercenaries that, uh, in fact, retained that these areas would retain much more in common with Ireland, uh, culturally speaking, than with the rest of Scotland, in, in, a, in a sense, um, especially in fact the westernmost ends. And the military strength of the Isles, as you can imagine, as we were saying before, was was very modest, right? Um, the the only consistently populated area uh, was Caithness on on the main, mainland, right? So uh, the rest uh, had actually very low demographic density. The largest army ever recorded was raised by Harald Maddader's son, uh, and counting up to six thousand men, in order to fight the Scots in Caithness in uh, 1202. Uh, however, mm, this probably contained not just the, um, the local levy of Caithness, but presumably also the one of the Orkneys. Uh, and if we were to describe the, their, the, the, or their military organization proper, uh, this army still looked pretty similar to the, um, to the old uh, here uh, system. Right, uh, like the the armies of the King of Norway. So these was the uh, earls or king's household retainers that formed a sort of semi-professional um, uh, troop, uh, essentially an elite one. Could speak of semi-professional, full professional, depending on considering these men had, you know, considering their physical strength, what they were able to, have, what they were up to all the time. Yes, it was a full-time occupation. Right, and aside from naturally the rhythms imposed by seasonal warfare, also by this not really, you know, mild uh, weathers of the north. But let's say that they, that's what they did in, in life: constantly fighting against each other, and therefore having a very high individual quality as as fighters, and retaining a lot of the older, you know, warlike ethos of let's say of the. Of, of the Viking era, in a sense. Um, also, just by the entrepreneuriality of their, as we'll see, their maritime capabilities, if not properly their their seaborne uh, capacities. Um, then, uh, next to these um, core of uh, semi-professional troops, you have the retainers of the Göding, right? The that were the chief landed men, right? Um, that were in command of the district levies. Altogether, these forces, as we've seen, were not large. Um, in Caithness, in, um, in 1158, two Orkney's earls, Rögnvald Kali Kolson, uh, 
1136-1158 circa and Harald Maddaderson were accompanied by no more than 20 horsemen and 100 foot soldiers. Here, however, speaking of retinues, right, so it's a very modest force, really. Um, and, but still at least significant for the the, the average uh, po population density and also as we've seen for the, the quality. Um, we know naturally of larger forces too that were raised through the military um, levy comparable um, to the Scandinavian Leidang, so the local militias that um, uh, were we, about which we know the districtuation in, in uh, in, in the Orkneys as well as in the in the Southern Isles, uh, the Orcadian one, um, the Orcadian levy was uh, constituted by six Husabi districts, totaling 216 Uris lands that would be essentially ounce lands. Uh, this term comes from the Old Norse a um, Aris land, um, each of which was in turn divided into 18 penny lands, so called at least in Anglicization, and in turn organized into four quarters called Scotlands. So that would equate to something like four and a half penny lands. Um, these uh, last quarters would have each provide uh, uh, a well armed and supplied fighting man to the light down. Uh, so if we make the mass here, the, the total of the Orkney levy would count 860 men in total, right? Uh, consider also that this is like the ideal, right? If we were to con count the Leidang in Scandinavia, we'd get very high numbers, actually, but the, the armies were levied were much smaller, um, so we can't think there would be even less. Um, for as far as properly the local forces were concerned, normally levied and issued. Yet there is some doubt about the these numbers because um, considering now the maritime capabilities and therefore the, the, therefore the forces that were put at sea, we can suppose that the armies mobilized by the, the Arcadians were larger, right? And that these 860 men might have instead actually counted in fact, the, the only effectively mustered men, and in time of peace, whereas, you know, of course, you know, these were more populated uh, lands than, than that. Um, therefore, and this is what we get mostly from the the size and number of the Orcadian ships. These were bulky, high-sized vessels, uh, apparently more than 20 benches, um, and um, so either 25 or 30, and each one capable of actually carrying large numbers of men, right? Uh, these, from these um, sizes, we think of something, according to modern estimates, between 160 to 260 men, right? Uh, there were naturally smaller ships, too. There are some also mentioned uh, in the sagas, the, the, the 10 or 20 benches uh, once, um, but these were apparently just for traveling, not for for military use, which is a bit work mystic differentiation, but still. Um, naturally, the the Earl had the largest ship, and the most ordinate, the ones around which uh, would be more um, more, uh, you know, better troops, better fed, better, better, better equipped, um, and also, th literally, the, the strongest ship. Um, in fact, um, by the 12th century, we can imagine these flagships to have had like 30 or even more benches and very large crews. We're talking about significantly multiple hundreds. Um, there is an account um, about the ship of Earl Rögnwald that took on crusade in 1151 uh, having uh, a, a 35 benches, which would make this ship uh, an, even, an even bigger one than Olaf uh, Tryggva's son's famous Long Serpent. Uh, there is some debate about this because objectively we don't have much other information but what the sagas say. Um, some authors have, mm, let's say, mm, tended towards the lower estimates by associating the number of ships to this 
um, to the, the aforementioned d district system and therefore um, arriving to like uh, like not more than four or six for the Orkneys altogether and that these were all, would have been only 18 benches um, but the the point is that the sagas say very different things um, they, they tell us for example of 1314 Orcadian vessels at the Battle of uh, Floru Vagar in 1194 being larger than the Norwegian 20 benchers, right? And in fact, um, the saga's um, approach, methodological approach, seems to be the most convincing. Uh, Clouston especially says that the, the Orkneys put could put together, you know, a full levy of 16 ships of 25 or 30 benchers. Um, from the Gödding specifically, so just from the Leidang. Um, this, uh, this is supported by the sources that state that the Earls of Orkneys uh, individually could raise seven or, s uh, or eight ships from their own halves of the earldom, right? Um, and uh, the, um, uh, this would be Hakon Paulson uh, with 1811 uh, 17. Uh, we know of Earls like Erland, Haraldson, and Rögnvald Kali se having seven and eight respectively in 1154. Um, naturally, the Earls were normally leading these expeditions themselves, uh, and numbers appear to have been around five ships on a, uh, on a base, um, which uh, would have um, been the same number provided by the Göding, probably. Um, this system was also very, um, let's say, as we were saying, th there was a high pressure on these polities, so they would m mostly go at war uh, uh, on a constant base, and there doesn't seem to have been, uh, if not perhaps for the latest times, but it's mm, debatable, probably was an integrated system, a proper money payment, right? Uh, these people lived still with kind of a Viking mentality uh, that would repay the the participants to the expeditions through the plunder accumulated and not through other means of uh, you know of a, a salary or a, no so in total we could think that towards the the 12th century the earls of orkney could master a maximum 14 16 ships right with a consistent amount of of troops on board uh, 13th century fleets might have actually increased in size. We know of um, 20 ships mentioned on one occasion in 1231. Uh, the largest Arcadian fleet on record ever dates to 1046, when Earl Thorfinn raised 60 ships. Uh, albeit these are described as quite small, so not like the 25-30 the benchers. Uh, and um, this uh, fleet also included vessels from Caithness in the Hebrides, in addition to the Orcadian ones. Uh, while their enemies, uh, led by Earl Regnwald Brusason, had 30 ships, also small, uh, including troops coming from Shetland and Norway as well. So that's the thing I was telling you before about joining forces and therefore the increase of size. These were quite trafficked areas, right? It wasn't just what the Orkneys or the the, uh, the Southern Isles would be able to, to put together, but really forces could arrive from here and there. Um, speaking, in fact, of the Southern Isles in the Hebrides and the Isle of Man, uh, we find a similar military district creation. This, there's still the ounce land uh, and quarter uh, systems, known as quarter lands. Uh, the ounce lands were called by a Celtic term of Tirunga, into the Hebrides at least, um, and these would be corrupted into trees on man. So these, the households, literally. So a much later source also states that there were 176 trains on the Isle of Man. For a total levy of 700 men, or 17 ships, um, assuming the 20 benches average, and interestingly, yet it could be a coincidence, we know that there were 17 parishes on man, so it's possible that each of these had to provide a ship uh, on its own. And 
However, uh, Hafström uh, uh, hypothesized that man's six districts, called the Shadings, which is a term that comes from the Old Norse Settung, which means a sixth, could equate to the 36 trains like those of, of Orkney. So this would equate to the same 860 men we have seen. So a comparable force, um, which would be interesting, gives kind of an idea of how equal this, this, this polities could, you know, even for not the problem of not being reunited, you know, they could more or less levy the same manpower. So, uh, this is just hypothesis. But when King Magnus swore fealty eventually to, to King Alexander III of Scotland, um, he still promised as a um, as a as a as a, as a few as a homage right at that point, uh, ten galleas piratas in Latin that he said the pirate ten pirate galleys right whenever there was the need. Uh, this is interesting because gradually, these lands, especially after 1263, as we've seen, were gradually enthiffed by the Scots that, however, still demanded the uh, the ship levy, like in Scandinavia, because even at least societies were functional to that had functionalized themselves like that. I mean, the interland was kind of hellish, so uh, it would be interesting for the same Scots to kind of, you know, put in their hands on, on these lands to, to still demand uh, what these were best at, right, and projecting themselves towards the sea. And of these ten pirate ga so-called pirate galleys, and that tells you a bit, you know, uh, what, you know, the business was, either from, independently from, from the perspectives involved in here, um, this, this were continuing to be, to be, like in Viking, right, it was piracy fundamental. Um, this ten galleys had to be, uh, um, five of, uh, half of 24 benches, right, and the other five, 12 benches. So naturally there was a segmentation, also the type of ships, um, and the service recorded in being owed to the Scottish crown by the Earl of Moray in exchange for, for the island in 1313 is, however, only uh, six 13 bench ships, right? Which could actually speak for the general decline of the political military capabilities of these lands. The decline also economic. Was I mean, here Scotland was rocketing in perspective. Um, of course, England as well. So th there were new balances, and that also that kind of lifestyle, just as in Scandinavia at the end of the Viking, right, w was doomed uh, to to decline up to a certain point. But still, you know, it's kind of a, a long sunset. And after the mid 12th century, we also know that Hebridean ships were much smaller there than their Orcadian counterparts. Uh, they were called, in fact, uh, Nybags or uh, Nivikes, that is, little ships, um, introduced, it is said, by Somerled. Uh, this could speak actually for uh, not a decline in military capabilities, but on the contrary, to a um, tactical development, a refinement, that would actually put a you know, greater emphasis on speed and maneuverability than you know, the, the older, bulkier, larger ships. In fact, Somerled is said to have built uh, a fleet of 58 or 80 of such vessels, small ones, as we've seen, um, with hinged rudders and uh, masthead fighting tops um, for, reconquering, for reconquering the Hebrides in 1156. And these, in fact, would, these vessels would, provide, would prove to be more maneuverable uh, and having even an advantage in firepower over the uh, the more typical longships of their uh, adversaries. This is fascinating because it also speaks of a uh, more um, you know advanced even you know missile capability. You know how mm, these tactics were fundamentally uh, very very simple. It's, it's the Viking era, it, they they literally attacked each other at distance with with longbows at closer range, even with rocks. Yes, these ships were sometimes loaded with rocks. They would throw at each other. Eventually, there would be a functionalization here. You can imagine also crossbows gradually towards the 13th century appearing. I mean, at least you know, um, not really appearing because crossbows had always existed. Even if you look at early medieval Scotland, they were always there. But I mean, appearing also in more constant. Um, quantity and quality like in the rest of Europe uh, but for the rest uh, yeah it was all about boarding right also they didn't have much capability of sinking each other at a distance 
and uh, you can imagine this um these extremely bloody fights um breaking out in, in on the decks as much as on on the mainland we we've talked about the galog likes um individual combat it's something of the, the most unspeakably nightmarish experiences a, a, a mind can't, can't imagine of you know limbs flying off chopping these men were were pretty damn tough right uh there was a, a an extremely tough selection so enormous physical strains right uh but for a reality that was mostly about skirmishing and you know small pockets of men uh, raids right you can speak of a sort of blitzkrieg uh, at the end of the day because that's what uh, also the ships were about, these amphibious operations, sudden assaults and so on. It was all about that game, right? But at the same time, on land, it was still modest forces, but still relying greatly on the individual's capability and the lack of a broader, you know, collective cap capacity. And that's how they always try to compensate. Um, needless to say, uh, military systems like just, like, I don't know, the, the one that was developing in, uh, in, in the Kingdom of Scotland were dramatically more advanced and uh, also you know more resourceful and so on um in fact also orcadian and uh, hebridean armies included scots it's normal right and um hebridean armies had also lots of irishmen as well uh, in 1164 for example when somerled raised a force of allegedly 160 ships um this um, this is according to the chron uh, Chronicle of Man. It comprised quote a large army from Ireland and various places as well. So all, all you know those who could join, as it was typical in this kind of raiding um, uh, maritime enterprises. And another source um, includes the the so-called Ostmen, uh, so the the foreigners of Dublin, um, according to to another. This is how they, they were called. The, the Osmen were technically uh, the, you know, the, the reminiscence of the idea that these had been Vikings back in the day, right, coming from, from the East. But actually called the, as these in English, in fact, by the English, um, referring to the Norse Giles. And hell, we're talking about Dublin, that, uh, as you know, it was of a, a, a Viking foundation. So they, it's as if these were still seen as the the guys of the East, even though they were actually the guys of of the West, uh, but they that was the mark on such uh, on the Celtic fringe of Scandinavian of Scandinavian influence. So regarding the strength of um, the latter force, there is also um, a passage in the Carmen de Morte Sumerledi that speaks specifically and actually realistically of one thousand Hebridans, Argyle men, and Gallienses which would be basically the, the, the transliteration in Latin of the Galloglags, I believe. Um, in fact, indicating Irishmen uh, in general. Those, um, uh, there are, however, um, other sources recording Somerled's casualties eventually in a, in a, in a battle with the Scots, who have included thousands of dead and thousands of, uh, thousands of wounded. Right, can be an exaggeration, but still speaking for... Um, for a large uh, force that in fact here is described as 10,000 men that uh, probably exaggerated but still speaks for you know imposing numbers definitely not just those you know 20 cavalry men and 100 men just from the local no and and this speaks of how, how as we were saying before naturally there were many mercenaries around joining this stuff um, we find still in 1310 Norsemen an Irishman of the Hebrides under John Mac Swibne, uh launching a campaign as deep as the uh, the Scottish earldom of Menthaith in the very heart of Scotland. Right. All right. So eventually, so this is more or less, as you you understand, it's a very you know still Viking, we could say, sounding reality for what Viking actually meant. Naturally, it, it's a it's a logical system that you can find as the general levies here, including also the ship uh, service and so on, that was functional to these polities. Um, in fact, political and strategical needs. Um, and we will talk in detail uh, eventually of properly troops types, um, 
tactics at some point. Um, this was pretty much it and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.